my favorite sponsor and your favorite sponsor, apparently, because you guys have been going to PalomaVerdeCBD.com and using code BUCK for 20% off your order quite a bit. I've become their best advertiser and I'm happy to do that for them because I love them as people. They're a wonderful family. They support this show and I love their products. They've got all kinds of things, including some new ones because of this new farm bill that's been passed. They've got, of course, regular full spectrum unflavored CBD tinctures. They've got these new THC V gummies. They've got the massage oil you know about. They've got the sleeping bundle if you guys need some help sleeping. If you're sore, they have these CBD bath bombs. But me personally, I have to go for the cool menthol sports cream if you guys lift and work out. It's the most effective sports cream I've ever used. They've got things for your pets, the CBD dog chews, pet tinctures. They've got so much CBD salve. A lot of the stuff now has this THCV in it, and it's a minor cannabinoid found in the cannabis sativa strain. It's isolated from the hemp plant for their line. A lot of people call it diet weed. Anyway, go check it out. They're wonderful people. These products are really good. They work, I promise you that. I use the products that I advertise. Let's put it that way. And again, it's at palomaverdecbd.com. Enter promo code BUCK at checkout and get you 20% off of your order. Let's get to the show. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. Glad you're with me here once again this week. Welcome to all the new listeners. You new people filter in every week, it seems, and I'm glad to have that. Glad to have you here. And this month of January to start out 2023 has been nothing except priests, Orthodox priests. And I did that by design. And I was on a couple of shows recently. You can check those out, the 2-Bit podcast. And I was on Unregistered with Thaddeus Russell discussing a lot of stuff, the journey, I suppose, that I've taken in life and how the podcast stuff started way back with you old timers that remember the Death to Tyrants podcast, the transition into Counterflow and kind of the running themes and the story arc and the different directions I've taken. But I do say, I will say, this was by design to have Orthodox priests on the entire month of January, because I think it's a wonderful way to start the year. And so it's not going to be that throughout. I've already got a lot of guests lined up for February and beyond, but I just wanted to start off the year in such a holy manner with great priests. And I've got another one here today. Before we get to him, I should say, I've been advertising the patreon.com slash counterflow $5 or more per month gets you in the club. We will be doing Zoom sessions each month. The first one was spectacular. I'm working on the second one now. And so all you guys got to do, and again, I always say this, but just for the new people, if you join at patreon.com slash counterflow, five bucks or more a month donation, that's all you do. And the Zoom call that we do is not recorded. It's not going to be on the podcast. It won't be on YouTube or Rumble or anywhere else. It's private. It's between you guys and me and our guests. And uh, it's going to be fun. I look forward to doing a lot of those this year. So back to my guest today, Father John Whiteford, such a wonderful person. I've had the honor of attending his parish several times now, and I know there will be several in the future. Really well-researched, really wonderful person. And he's been doing this stuff a long time, blogging about social, political, religious, spiritual topics for a lot longer than most of us have been doing anything like this, certainly on the internet. You're going to find that out as we get into it here. He did a four-part series that I really enjoyed called The Birth of a New Religion. And each one of the parts deals with some issues within the church and within society at large, we can say really globally at this point. And so the topics are the LGBTQP agenda, the abortion agenda, the ecumenical agenda, and the renovationists. So, I mean, I know several of those words are going to be familiar to you. 
let's say this. You'll find out very quickly. He is a wonderful man and a man that is very bold and does not mince his words. He speaks the truth boldly. And I think that's why so many people just love this guy. I'll tell you really quick. Father John Whiteford is the archpriest and pastor at St. Jonah Orthodox Church in Spring, Texas. He might've been born in California, but he came to Texas as soon as he could. And he's here on Counterflow. Father John Whiteford, welcome to the show, sir. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. It's It's been a long time. I guess this is the first official podcast feed that I've had you on. There was a, a live stream that we did with some friends about a year ago, it seems. Like, I, yeah. think, I think still to this day, that live stream is my most viewed video on YouTube, which is kind of cool. Hmm. Um, so since this is the first official version of having you on, give my listeners anything you find pertinent, a little introduction as to who Father John Whiteford is. Well, um, you know, I became Orthodox in 1990. I was studying to be a Nazarene minister, just gotten out of college. But while I was in college, I started studying Orthodoxy and uh, would have been baptized sooner than I was, but I was waiting on my wife, but it wasn't really her fault because I didn't tell her anything about orthodoxy until I was convinced that it was what I wanted to do because I didn't want to confuse her if I wasn't sure. Uh, so anyway, I became orthodox then and uh, was made a deacon in 1995 and then a priest in 2001, and we got a blessing to start our parish in 1998 and um, did reader services until I was ordained a priest. And uh, in addition to that, um, you know, our website's been posting liturgical texts and rubrics uh, since 1998, I believe. And um, so um, also I added the St. Innocent liturgical calendar and uh, my sermons are posted on Ancient Faith Radio. And of course, I've been blogging uh, since about, uh, I guess, 2004. What, real quick, while I was uh, researching you, I discovered there's a podcast format to listen to your homilies each week, correct? Right, AFR has it. And then also on our website, I also post it. Um, I post it on our website to make it easier for AFR to download it. But okay. if, if AFR ever decides to pull the plug on me, I, I, I won't have to worry about my sermons disappearing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> not, not that that's in the works or anything. I'm just saying if it ever happens, I don't, sure. I don't want to be caught uh, flat-footed. Right. You're uh, a lot of people I, I listen to and speak with in person reference your blog as, as very uh, helpful for new people, even for old people. I've heard say that I, I still go back and, and read Father John Whiteford's blog when I have a question about something or other. How long have you been doing that? I know you just said it quickly, but uh, I just want to ask you a few things about it and kind of what inspired you to start doing that. Because, you know, I you're a little bit older than I am, but I am old enough to remember that I think when you started, if I have the dates right, blogging, that was kind of before that was really a thing. So kind of talk about um, what got you into that and, and, and what you do in that. Well, I started writing articles and posting them on our website before I even had the blog. It's just the blog became a very convenient way of doing what I was already doing. I got internet access uh, when I was working for the state of Texas back in, I think, 1993 or 94, something like that. And at that time, it was just email. But uh, there was a, a internet, uh, an Orthodox listserv on the Indiana University website. And um, that was like the early days of Orthodox uh, people interacting around the world online. And um, you know, so I spent a lot of time writing responses to things that people would post. And then eventually it occurred to me that, you know, I'm spending all this time to, to post responses to people that are going to be seen today and forgotten tomorrow. And it would be a lot better to write thoughtful articles that I could just send links to people with and say, you know, when these, when these particularly when, when I saw a subject kept coming up over and over again, Mm -hmm. it'd be, I figured it'd be a lot easier to just have a good article go and say, okay, well, here's where I deal with this. You can read this article. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I got started. And I, even before that, I, I wrote a, I wrote the Sola Scriptura essay, which was published by Ancient Faith um, um, 
Press, which at that time was Conciliar Press. I think they published it in 95, but it was published in, 90, excuse me, 96, but it was published in 95 by Frankie Schaefer's uh, magazine, The Christian Activist, before he went uh, totally nuts. And uh, so that was when it first saw the light of day, but I actually wrote the, the essay a couple of years prior to that. You say that uh, you would get a lot of common questions, the same ones over, and, and rather than just respond individually, just post uh, broader responses for everyone. What are a few of those things that people come to you and it's a con- kind of a consistently repetitive thing about orthodoxy? Well, I mean, you know, some of the, the, the most, most more notorious subjects would be things like the question of the toll houses because people run okay. across references to it and they... It's something they've never heard of before if they've not grown up in the church, maybe even if they did grow up in the church. And so it's one of these kinds of things that keeps getting raised all the time online. And so I um, put together some stuff on that subject to basically address that. It's not something I think, especially converts, ought to be focused a lot, focus a lot of their time on, but it is a teaching of the church. And... Uh, Dismissing it as many people want to do is not a healthy thing. Ecumenism and issues related to that often come up. Our view of the non-Orthodox, um, how we should interact with the, with the non-Orthodox. There was also back, especially in the 90s, there were a lot of people who were attacking Roque War because at that time we were still not uh, reconciled with the Moscow Patriarchate. And so you had... People would get online and say, "Well, you're non-canonical," and these are a lot mm. of times these were people of the OCA who were in an even less canonical situation prior to 1970 when they did come under the Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, so it was kind of ironic in many ways. So I, you're putting together historical references to answer those kinds of questions was something that I found uh, it was better to just do it in one article and not have to keep uh, digging it all up uh, over and over again. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of articles, uh, there's a four-part series, and I wanted to get you on this show to discuss it, uh, broadly titled The Birth of a New Religion, and in each part you break down uh, some some incoming threats to the Orthodox Church. And I, I found it interesting because on this show, I talk about uh, the culture wars and, and kind of the spiritual warf- warfare going on across the globe, really. And it's a lot of those subjects that I discuss you see as possibly uh, infiltrating orthodoxy. And I hadn't even thought of it in those terms yet, uh, because again, we're so worried about the outside world and and there there are a lot of threats. And so you kind of break each one of these pieces down into a a singular subject, but broadly, of course, uh, the threat that they're posing to the orthodox church. And it seems, at least from my perspective, for me, uh, a lot of people look at orthodoxy as kind of a, like the last stand, really, like the last safe haven left of, of goodness and beauty and purity and tradition. And I think that there's a possibility that that's why some of these uh, bad actors could be infiltrating this because it is, it's like if we could conquer orthodoxy and, and have this schism, then it seems to them that they would have won. Um, I could be looking at that in kind of a strange manner, but it, what... What motivated you to write this four-part series? And it was anything I just said um, part of that. Well, the initial impetus to it was when uh, Archbishop Elplet of Forrest gave his uh, infamous speech at the March for Life right before the, uh, it, it, I guess it was almost a year ago, uh, right before the Supreme Court actually overturned Roe versus Wade, but he essentially came out saying that Roe versus Wade was right. He didn't use those words, but he essentially came out arguing the pro-choice position. And uh, and I was asked by a uh, you know a, a Greek priest that I know, uh, it, it, you know, he was encouraging me to write such a response. And I thought, well, rather than just writing a response on that one subject, I think I should write it in terms of a, a broader spectrum of issues that I see coming to the fore. And I, I do think that there's, there's some, it, the, it, this is not just happening on its own. This is not organic. Mm-hmm. That there, there are entities that are trying okay. to break up the Orthodox Church. 
and uh, they're using their influence. And, and I think the U.S. government is a big part of it. And this may sound very conspiratorial to people who aren't familiar with the facts, but it is a fact that the ecumenical patriarchate has been under the thumb, basically, of the U.S. State Department, at least since World War II. And um, when Patriarch Athenagoras was elected, no doubt with American influence, to be the new patriarch of Constantinople, because prior to that, he'd already told the predecessor to the CIA that that uh, the ecumenical patriarchate was willing to do whatever the American government wanted them to do without even asking, you know, what that might be or setting any parameters for it. And when he was elected, he was flown to uh, Istanbul on the, the precursor to Air Force One, which was called by Harry Truman, the Holy Cow. Mm-hmm. And uh, so to have the American government flying a bishop to take possession of his new uh, uh, office, it wasn't just because he was, Harry Truman was a nice guy. You know, he, he, he did it because he saw this as having a lot of influence in a certain part of the world, particularly Eastern Europe and uh, the Middle East to some extent. And... Um, More recently, I think the U.S. government has seen diminishing the influence of the Russian church as a means of diminishing the influence of Russia as a whole. And of course, the Russian church is the biggest part of the Orthodox church. And uh, it's it's more than 50% of the Orthodox church is the Russian church. So if you break up uh, the, the Russian church's influence on the rest of the church, you're splitting it almost down the middle. And uh, that's what they've been trying to do. And and so when they had this, the ecumenical patriarchs suddenly turn on a dime and recognizing schismatic bishops that he had himself, you know, consistently recognized as being bogus. Uh, it wasn't accidental that you had American diplomats going around the world, meeting with the heads of local Orthodox churches and putting the pressure on them to acknowledge this new schismatic church as the legitimate church of Ukraine. Uh, so so what, why is the U.S. government concerned about this? It's not because they care anything about Orthodox theology. They only care about power. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to, to break up the church as a means of hurting Russia. You, you mentioned uh, ecumenical patriarch in that. And, and I want to actually... Uh, Ecumenism is is the first topic, even though it was part four of your series. It's the first one I wanted to ask you about because it seems like it's the definition of that's kind of changed over the years. And prior to my becoming a catechumen, it was a word I wasn't super familiar with. And once I got into orthodoxy, you'd hear older versions of it, like, of course, the councils and whatnot. And then this new version of ecumenism all of a sudden is not good. So there's people I know that will be listening to this that aren't clear on what that is. But can you talk about uh, how the meaning has shifted over the years and, and just broadly talk about uh, ecumenism and the threat that it represents to us now? Well, the word ecumenical, uh, it, it comes from the Greek word ecumene, which was, means universal. And it was a way that the Roman Empire referred to itself, and not just the Roman Empire as the West usually is recognizing it, recognized it, but the Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire, continued to refer to itself this way. And um, so when they had ecumenical councils, that was just a way of referring to the, these councils as being universal councils. They weren't local councils, they were councils for the entire uh, uh, ecumene and, and and even beyond the boundaries of the Roman Empire. So um, there's nothing wrong with that term. But what happened was, is in the 20th century, you had the ecumenical movement uh, come on the scene. And so they began to twist what the meaning of that word was to, to mean something entirely different, which is not all the Orthodox Church, but now all the, the different Christian groups uh, coming together in one way or another. And so you had precursors to the World Council of Churches, but eventually you had the World Council of Churches trying to get representatives of every Christian group together and to come to agreements on various issues 
And they would often fondly talk about that their hope that everybody would all be in communion and we'd all be one big happy family. And in the earlier days of the ecumenical movement, you had Orthodox representatives that participated in these meetings, but they did so in a way that didn't uh, sell the store. They, like Father George Florowski, for example, was a, a representative at one of these, or it's maybe several of these meetings, but he issued documents, which he was to clarify to the non-Orthodox that, hey, even though we are participating in this entity called the World Council of Churches, we believe that the Orthodox Church is the church. And you know, we'd like to have good relations, but you know, if you want to be in the church, you've got to be in our church because this is the church that Christ founded. Because this is how Orthodox Christians all the, have always understood themselves. And so in the Nicene Creed, when it says, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, if you look at what those fathers understood by that, they didn't mean uh, to include the Novatians and the Donatists and the Arians or all the other groups. And not just for, you know, they, 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 you might say, well, yeah, heretical groups, of course, they would exclude those groups. But there were schismatic groups that really differed in no substantial way uh, from the rest of the church in terms of their theology, other than the fact that they had decided to break off for whatever reason. And so they were considered to be outside of the church. And, uh, and, and so that's what that means. Any, so anybody who says they believe in the Nicene Creed, but doesn't believe that there's only one visible church, doesn't really believe in the Nicene Creed, because that's what it says. If you, if you don't believe that, then you, you, you've denied that creed. Can you, for those also listening that are going, what creed is he talking about? Uh, explain what that is really quick. Well, the Nicene Creed, uh, it's also known as the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed because it actually was, there was an original version of it that was uh, put forth by the Council of Nicaea, the first ecumenical council. And then at the second ecumenical council, they essentially completed it. Because the original creed just said, I believe in the Holy Spirit. You know, something like that. It didn't, it didn't elaborate much on what the Holy Spirit was. But then it, in the Finnish creed, it took the form that we know now and uh, you know, spells out a little bit more about the, the Holy Spirit and also what, the, what we believe about the church and the sacraments. Uh, so this is the basic statement of um, what we believe. In the Roman Catholic Church, they still use the Apostles' Creed as probably the primary thing that laity are expected to memorize and use in their personal prayers, uh, although they affirm, at least theoretically, the Nicene Creed, although they've added a word to it that uh, we consider to be heretical. But... Uh, um, but the, in the Orthodox Church, the Apostles' Creed doesn't really play any role. There's nothing wrong with the Apostles' Creed. It's just not very complete. Uh, it was a an an fairly ancient Western creed, but the Nicene Creed is the creed that the entire church embraced. And uh, so that's what we use in our private prayers and what we affirm when we serve the liturgy. There's a problem, as you point out in, the, in uh, this piece on ecumenism, with uh, saying the Orthodox Church is just one of many branches of Christianity in the church. And um, I feel that this could ruffle some feathers, but I, I know that's not, I don't think it's meant to do that. But explain, I, let me put it this way. I have friends and, and have over the years that are Christian that'll say, well, it just depends what you like, if it's Baptist or Methodist. Or at the time, of course, years ago, a lot of people weren't saying Orthodox because they didn't know. But they'll often say, well, it's just whatever church makes you kind of feel the best or wherever you find the, the best vibe with the priest or, or the pastor, or uh, as I cringe saying this, whatever has the best band or something like that. But it, there is an issue with saying the Orthodox church is just one of many branches. And can you explain why that is? Well, for one thing, Protestants that have that kind of a view should understand that nobody had that view. If you go back a couple hundred years, even Protestants didn't take that view, that you could basically just pick what you liked. Every Protestant group affirmed that their group was right. Now, they might affirm that groups that they didn't agree with were Christians in some sense, but they usually took a fairly dim view of them, and they didn't encourage people to just pick the one that they liked the best. Uh, 
And uh, if you go back prior to the Protestant Reformation, nobody took that view even remotely because every group, you know, there have been some historical schisms, although like maybe one every 500 years, roughly, it was a major schism. Uh, But uh, the groups that still exist always affirm that they were the church. So the question you, you, some people will ask, well, how do you know which one is which? Well, you have to go and look and see what was the reason why the system happened and who was the one that changed. And I, I, if we went step by step through each of these systems, I could explain, lay out why I think the groups that broke off from us are the ones that changed and why we are the ones that continued to maintain the faith. But you simply just don't find this view of doctrinal diversity, not even in in the New Testament itself, you don't find St. Paul saying, well, you know, there's these other people who don't agree with me, but, you know, they, they, they accept Jesus, so it's okay. We're all one big happy family. Uh, he believed that there was correct doctrine and there was false doctrine and there was no two ways about it. And when the Apostle John talks about certain people who wouldn't recognize his authority in his epistles, he doesn't say, well, you know, they love the Lord. We just have this disagreement, so they're okay. And, you know, uh, we, we hope maybe time and, you know, charity will bridge the gaps that we have. He, he, he didn't take that view. No, no Christians took that view. And uh, St. Cyprian of Carthage, who was a martyr prior to uh, the ending of the Roman persecution, so you can't accuse him of being tainted by Constantine or anything like that, uh, he wrote a very famous treatise called the the treatise on the unity of the church. And he lays this out as clearly as can be. And so this was the view of the church. You find it consistently stated by the fathers of the church before and after Nicaea. And certainly the Nicene Creed is affirming that view. But ecumenism has even gotten beyond what it used to be because it used to be, hey, wouldn't it be nice if all of us Christians that at least believe in the Trinity got together and we were all you know, able to take a communion together, even though we don't all agree on what communion is. Uh, and, um, you know, wouldn't it be nice? Well, it's beyond that. You've got, you've got people who take it so far that basically it's not just orthodoxy as one church among many denominations, but now Christianity is one religion mm-hmm. among many religions that are all going up the different ways, up the, the same mountain. And so they're all equally valid as far as that would be concerned. Yeah, that's obviously, uh, it's the slippery slope, which you discuss right. many points uh, in each, each one of these four articles. And you, uh, one thing I'll say about you, you're bold, I love it, in your, in your speaking and your wording. And uh, at, the, at the end of this piece on ecumenism, there's a, uh, a line here that we got to dive into. Ecumenism is working to merge renovationism, modernism, LGBTQP, and abortion activism into what will likely come to be the church of the Antichrist. And I took that, that one line is, is basically in my, it sums up everything and, and that you're writing about in all four parts. Can you right. kind of get into that? Well, the thing is, is the, the, the various... Uh, churches that are involved in the ecumenical movement, they're almost all apostate even by their own tradition, definition. So in other words, the Episcopalians that are involved in the ecumenical movement are apostates by the standards of their own forebears. Same thing with the Presbyterians, the Baptists, whatever you want to name. They are departing from what they used to believe and they're embracing uh, a very watered down version of Christianity, but one that now is opened up to accepting basically every religion. And I think that God's allowed that for one reason, because it makes it clear to the sincere people who, you know, if you grew up as a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian, it's not your fault that your family, uh, you know, bore you into that kind of a faith and you were raised to believe those things. But, um, When you see those religions going off the deep end, it makes it easier, I think, for people who are sincere seekers of the truth to say, hey, this can't be right, and to start looking for the truth. Do you guys miss purely political talk on this show? Because if you do, well, I hope you're enjoying what we're doing. 
But there are still great outlets for purely political and fun libertarian shows. Amongst the top of that list should be Lions of Liberty. I love these guys. I've known Brian and John for a long time. Lions of Liberty is one of the greatest and longest running libertarian slash anarchist podcast networks in the world, quite simply. They started a long time ago, so they know what they're doing. On Monday, John Odermatt delivers a powerful mix of inspiration, health, and faith to set your mind, body, and soul free with Finding Freedom. That's his show. And then, of course, every Wednesday, y'all know Brian McWilliams will make you laugh at all this craziness going on in this world. He even provides a bit of a promise of a better future with his show, Mean Age Daydream. And then Friday, they include shows like Meme Wars or Hate Watch, or of course, a show that I was on myself, The Infamous, or is it just famous? I don't know, but it's libertarians in living rooms drinking liquor. That's on Fridays. That was a very fun show to be a part of. If you go back in their old episodes of that one, I think uh, there's some quite hilarious moments in there. Lions of Liberty is the first step to finding freedom. Listen today to the Lions of Liberty Network everywhere podcasts are found. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, yes, indeed. Uh, Another thing that you end this article with, and this will merge us into the next topic, again, pretty bold, and this is a, a spicy topic, I guess we can say. You cannot advocate... LGBTQP ideology and be an Orthodox Christian. I love, I appreciate that you called it an ideology because uh, there's a lot of trickery with words in these movements as you're familiar with. Right. And it is an ideology. Uh, why did why did you use that word? Well, because, it, you know, it's it's not just, I mean, they they want you to believe that all these people are just people who are born that way, but they're people who have been indoctrinated into really an inhuman ideology. And that's one of the problems with ideology in general is ideology takes some idea and it makes it, it makes it the reality, not a means of interpreting reality, but it makes it reality. And so, and so you can't, you can't uh, make any adjustments to an ideology like that because everything else has to be made to fit it. And uh, it doesn't matter how, how inhuman it is or contrary to nature. And that's why you've got this insanity of people who, you know, you've got these grown men that are walking into women's locker rooms and now they can just say, well, I'm a, I'm a woman. And, oh, well, I guess that makes it okay. Whereas it wasn't that long ago that you would have been beaten over the head by every woman in that locker room and they would have chased you out and the cops would have locked you up and put you away. Uh, it, it, the idea that we're going to take not just adults that decide that they're a, a woman trapped in a man's body and cut them up to try to make them look like a woman, but we're going to do that to kids. Uh-huh. This is inhuman. This is... This is totally contrary to nature. And, uh, you know, one hope I have is that it's going to start catching up to these people because eventually reality will bite you in the butt. And when you have a view that, that flies in the face of reality, and I think more and more of the people who've gone down that road are starting to realize that they've been sold a bill of goods. Uh, so, yeah, it's an, it's an ideology that they're trying to force on us. And it's, it's amazing how when they first started off, it was all about, hey, just leave us alone. We want to do our own thing. And, you know, people, no, nobody wants to be mean to other people. I mean, at least not decent people. Everybody wants to be nice. And you can say, okay, you know, that's what you want to do and you're not hurting anybody else. I guess, you know, we're not going to beat you up with a baseball bat. We're not going to make it impossible for you to make a living. We're not going to kick you out of your house. Uh, so we'll we'll leave you alone to that extent. But then... Once they got into positions of power, uh, they don't extend the same kind of tolerance to anybody else. You know, I just saw in the news yesterday, some guy who was in the Mall of America that had a Jesus Saves shirt on that was told he had to take that shirt off or leave. And mm-hmm. I guarantee you that if, he, if a guy went in there with, you know, some kind of a gay slogan uh, on, on, his, on his T-shirt, that he would have been told to leave. Uh, so that's how far things have gone because we're, we're like in Bizarro world at this point. We're in the exact opposite of what uh, our culture used to be. He wouldn't not only not be told to leave, he'd probably get like 
waves and and smiles and and thumbs up from be, right. because now normal people think oh i have to kind of signal something that i'm i'm in the hip thing or whatever and i'm cool with everything uh, right. so so that's <laughs> my goodness uh, how is this ideology creeping into orthodoxy well as i said i don't think that it's organic although you know orthodox people particularly in the west we we're we're existing in a cultural milieu where our children are being bombarded with this stuff. And so we have people who get sucked up in it and, and buy it on one level or another. Either they actually start entering into that kind of a lifestyle or else they at least don't, they think it's mean to say bad things about that lifestyle because they've got friends that are into it, stuff like that. And so that's one aspect of it. But we, we've got people who are promoting it from the top. And I and we've got money there. You know, there's some, uh, there have been articles where people have sort of tra- tracked down the money trail for a lot of these organizations, and a lot of this money traces itself back to different government entities. Uh, so they're they're clearly trying to push this, and they see doing it in English in the West as a means of influencing the rest of the Orthodox Church. But like public orthodoxy, which is one of the worst websites out there that that claims to be orthodox promotes perversity on a constant basis but they translate every article into like seven different languages uh, anybody who's who's been involved in nonprofit charitable organizations knows that most nonprofit organizations churches in particular have a shoestring budget there's a lot more they would like to do than they can afford to do so if you see an organic Orthodox website, they're not translating every article into seven languages because they can't afford to make that happen. Mm-hmm. But, but they'd probably, even if they had people who could do it for free, just the time it would take to post all those different versions and different languages would be something that would be difficult for people who are doing this on a volunteer basis. But pu- public Orthodoxy is somehow able to do it. And it's not you know, it, it's not because they're just getting tons of donations from the faithful to make that happen. They're getting money from outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fordham University is often brought up in these type of discussions. And for those who either hear it or and aren't totally dialed in on what that is, and for the new people that don't know what it is, can you talk about kind of the threat? I, I mean, I, I say threat. I don't want to give them too much strength, but they are subverting some things. So can you talk about what's going on with that? Well, Fordham University is the, the the university that public orthodoxy is associated with, and they have a institute for orthodox studies or something like that. And the two heads of it are uh, George Demacopoulos and Aristotle uh, Papa Nicolaou, who are both members of the Greek Archdiocese, and they're pushing this stuff all the time. And unfortunately, the Greek Archdiocese has given them more than a tacit uh, seal of approval. So even though they're not an official entity of the Greek Archdiocese, they certainly have not been discouraged in any way from anything that they've been doing. And they've been doing it for a long time. And it just keeps getting worse as time goes on. And, and they're becoming more and more blatant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems as they feel uh, po- more power or something, they, it, this is human nature, but they're, they it's much more blatant and ham-fisted for the rest of us to see how obvious it is what they're doing. One of there's a lot of a kind of old tired tropes that if you get into this discussion with activists on the LGBT uh, kind of thing that they're going to pull out love is love. Well, a, a sin is sin. You can't judge me. Uh, often though, of course, I have noticed their definition of love isn't particularly biblical, and we can get into that. But what what are what's your response to some of these kind of they think gotchas uh, that they're going to tell you? Well, I mean, if you take scripture and tradition at all seriously, there's just not any question that the church and the scriptures have been abundantly clear that any kind of sex outside of that between a husband and a wife in a lawful marriage is fornication. And certain kinds of sex are worse than others. And so homosexuality is a particularly horrible kind of sin. It's referred to as an abomination. It's referred to as being contrary to nature. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, uh, 
you know, don't be deceived. These people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You know, people who engage in these sins. And he goes down a list and he mentions uh, in Greek, the word is uh, arsenikoiti, which it literally means men betters. And it's, it, it, it's derived from the wording in the Greek Septuagint from Leviticus, where it says a man shall not lie with another man as with a woman. It's an abomination. And then there's the other word that, it, that is used is uh, uh, malachi, which means literally soft men. And uh, it's translated different ways, sometimes to try to obscure uh, what, what is really being said in, in some translations, particularly today. But there's no doubt about it, but that this Orsenikiti uh, are, are people who are homosexuals. And the, the Malachi, sometimes are, some interpreters will say, well, the, the Malachi are the people who are actually on the receiving end of sodomy as opposed to the ones giving it. But uh, I think it's probably more likely that it's referring to men who feminize themselves and engage in, in uh, you know, prostitution. And so you could say it's kind of like the, the forerunner of the transgenderism that we're seeing today. Mm-hmm. But in any case, St. Paul's saying these people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But he says, but such were some of you, you know, but, you know, but you've been washed, you've been cleansed, you've been sanctified. So it's not as if these people are reprobates that can't be saved if they repent, but they have to repent. So if you love people who get sucked up into that kind of stuff and you're a Christian, Love would say that you need to encourage these people to repent and to get out of that, not to say it's okay. It might make you feel better to to not have a conflict with people and to just pat them on the head and say that they're all right. But if you really believe that them going down that road is going to result in them not inheriting the kingdom of God, then you be the most unloving person in the world to do that. And uh, so and love, you, you, you should love everybody. And uh, you know that two men can love each other, but that doesn't mean that two men can have sex with each other. Two men cannot have sex with each other and have that be okay from a Christian perspective. Uh, and uh, it, it's just not even close to being uh, an issue. And, and prior to about 2009, I don't think I ever heard anybody who was willing to put their name behind what they were saying who was an Orthodox Christian that ever questioned this question and tried to say that maybe homosexuality was okay. Uh, it was only after that you started to have some people who were kind of hinting around at it, and it's only gotten worse with time. But, uh, but this is very recent. This is not something that's been going on for a long time. Mm-hmm. When you put these pieces out, uh, pieces like this that we're talking about, I have to assume and hope that you get much more... Uh, positive feedback than pushback. Because I, I think you're saying, like I mentioned, you're obviously very bold in your wording and, and the way you write and present yourself. I think a lot of people look and, and love something like that, a bold message, the, the, the unafraid nature of orthodoxy, specifically Rokor in your case, rather than just kind of a mealy mouth, go along with whatever changes. Or I assume you get more positive feedback than negative. Uh, certainly that I see directly that has people who put their names to it. You know, oh, I, get, of course. I, yeah. I have people who take shots at me and basically it usually amounts to ad hominem uh, attacks that have nothing to do with the subject because it can't really engage on the substance. Right. There's not a way to make an argument from scripture or tradition that says that these things are okay. Mm-hmm. So they can't do that. So instead they try to say, you know, to attack you in other ways. You're, you're a meanie. Uh, it's not nice for you to say these things. Well, as I said, if you really believe that people are going to go to hell if they don't repent of these things, it's not very nice for you to not, not say something about it. <laughs> yeah, and well I, put. I, like most people, have known people and know people who struggle with homosexuality and other kinds of things in the spectrum of the alphabet soup stuff. Yeah, and. I care about these people. I want them to to repent. I want them to be saved. And so I encourage them in every way I can to to uh to reform and 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 to allow God's grace to heal them and to um you know make them into the kind of Christians that God wants them to be. I don't want to see them go to hell and you know I I don't hate them. I don't think that 
uh, I'm better than they are. I, if I was in the same situation that they were in, I don't know what I would be. You know, if I was born 20 or 30 years after I was, I might have gotten sucked up in this stuff too. Uh, so I, I can't, I don't think that I'm better than they are. I think that the, 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 tr- the truth is better than falsehood. And so that's what I'm trying to convince people of is to follow the truth. Because that's what St. Paul says is really behind all these perversions. You read about it in Romans chapter one. He says that this is the result of people who are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness because they don't want to deal with the truth. So instead they suppress it and they wind up going down these different roads into sexual immorality and idolatry and what have you because they're, they're trying to hide from God. They're trying to, they, they want to do what they want to do and uh, don't want God to interfere. And the, and God gives them up to uh, uh, the, their own choices. The wrath of God is, is revealed not by God striking people with thunderbolts, but by just standing back and saying, okay, you're going to go down that road. I'm, I'm taking my hands off and we'll see what happens. Because <laughs> as it turns out, if you take an anatomy class, uh, the human body wasn't designed for sodomy. And, and there are reasons why people who engage in that kind of stuff wind up getting all kinds of diseases and uh, dying young. It's also psychologically damaging. That's the reason why you have very high suicide rates and drug use and why they have domestic violence that's out of this world in their own relationships. Uh, it, you know, to the extent that they have something that they want to call marriage, those relationships tend to break up pretty quick, especially among women. Uh, men sometimes are able to hold it together because basically they have sort of an open relationship, not because they're really being monogamous in the sense that most people would understand the term. But women tend to not stay together because two women don't balance each other off and two men don't balance each other off. God created men and women different. And there are things about men that they need a woman's influence to help them balance out. And the the reverse is also true. And um, if you don't have that balance, you're going to be imbalanced. And and that imbalance is going to start to manifest itself by all kinds of pathologies. I want to talk about renovationism. That's another one I wasn't super familiar with. But as I started reading about it, it's exactly opposite of what I want within orthodoxy. And because of these new worldly, I mean, the problem with, with floating on every new worldly care and trend is that there's no, you're not grounded in anything. Uh, there's nothing true there. It's just, you know, the ways of this world. So can we talk about uh, renovationism and, and explain first what that is and the threat that that's posing? Well, basically, renovationism is something that people who are already orthodox for whatever reason, but who have basically lost their faith that the church is what it is or what it says that it is and that the tradition is something they can depend on and they're embarrassed by the fact that the church doesn't really line up with the values of this world. And so instead of trying to reform the world, they they try to reform the church to make it more like the world. And they think they're doing the church a favor to the extent they have any real faith at all. And uh, so some forms of this that we've seen in the history of the church in Russia, you had the living church, which was a rival church to the legitimate church that embraced communism. It, uh, it wanted to have married bishops. Uh, it wanted to allow priests to remarry if they got divorced or if they were uh, widowers. And uh, they wanted to shorten the services. They wanted to reduce the fast. Uh, that they they wanted to simplify things because they thought all these things are really holding the church back. If we could just make it more, you know, along the lines of what people want, then more people will come to church and it will be better. And uh, and they were conservatives by the standards of the renovationists today <laughs> because <laughs> the renovationists today are the ones that are wanting to introduce gay marriage down the road. They want to have women ordained as priests. Uh, they're going to have Trinity bishops one of these days, probably not in the far in the in the far distant future if they keep going down this road. So it's it's basically unbelieving people trying to get their hands on the church and and uh, changing things. And in the case of the Living Church, 
it it wound up dying out in Russia because the common faithful rejected it. They saw it as a plastic banana uh, uh, church that the Soviets were trying to prop up to destroy the real church. And even though the ecumenical patriarchate went into communion with the, the living church and denounced the legitimate church while they were under persecution, stabbed them in the back. And, uh, and Patriarch of Alexandria did so as well. And so there's a lot of parallels to what's going on right now because in Ukraine, mm-hmm. you've got another plastic banana church that likewise is full of all kinds of heretics and, uh, and people who don't really believe in anything. There was a video that just was posted, I think, yesterday that showed some sort of performance happening right in front of an iconostas. And some people said it was in the Kiev Caves lava. I hope it wasn't, yeah. but it was in some church. So it was still blasphemous. And um, these people are basically sympathetic to the to the to the neo Nazi ideology of uh, you know the Azov Battalion. You see the red and black flags, uh, which that's blood and soil is what the red and black stands for. This is you know this is harkening back to that whole fascist movement uh, before and during World War II, and uh, and the. Head of this group, Epiphany is is, is the name he goes by. I call him Epiphony. Uh, he uh, he was he was called by these two Russian comedians that spoof famous people from time to time and pretend to be somebody else, and they record it. And so we find out all kinds of interesting things about celebrities and politicians that we wouldn't otherwise know. But they called him up and pretended to be some ambassador from uh, I think Holland. And they were congratulating him on being elected uh, metropolitan. But in that course of the conversation, they said, you know, the Russian church is very uh, anti-LGBT and we're hoping that you will uh, take a a, a more friendly uh, stance on the question. And the response they got from him was, of course, yeah, we'll be much more open on that subject. And they're they're getting ready to, to, actually, they've already uh, started switching over to the new calendar. Epiphony just the other day I saw an article where he said to the people of Ukraine if you have a Russian patron saint you need to find another one wow and that's probably you know like at least half of the people in Ukraine right. have a Russian yeah. saint that they're named for uh, and and most people in the Russian church never made a distinction between Russian and Ukrainian right. saints they kind of all considered them to be part of the same and you know St. John of Shanghai he was born in Ukraine uh, you read what he has to say about the Russian church, the czar. You never get the sense that he felt like he was anything other than a Russian. Mm-hmm. He, he doesn't identify himself as a Ukrainian. And, uh, and I think that's the way most people, at least historically in Ukraine, have thought. Certainly those that grew up speaking Russian, as St. John did. There's, it's frustrating to see this lack of understanding. And maybe there's a lack of caring too much about it, but so many people that that actually pay attention to politics and watch Tucker and and things that kind of grasp what could be going on politically, geopolitically, I should say. The and I sound like a boomer here, but our tax money that that is taken from us and funneled up through the feds is going in to Ukraine to pay for operations like you're like you just described. So basically, in a sense, money that we earn is going to destroy um, the true church in Ukraine, just so I can bottom line that, correct? Right, right. Yeah, okay. That's uh, really sad. And and I would think that uh, if somebody had the money to do it and they filed a lawsuit and this came before the Supreme Court, that there'd at least be a fair chance that the Supreme Court would say this is a violation of uh, the First Amendment because it's definitely... Uh, interfering with the free exercise of religion when you're trying to break up my church, when you're trying to destroy yes. my church, you're interfering with my right to exercise my faith. Yeah, that's a good point. And in mate. Ukraine, it's not just that there is a phony baloney plastic banana church now, but they are actively persecuting the legitimate church. And this is including murdering people. This is including beating priests, uh, planning false evidence to try to slander clergy. Uh, you know, their, their version of the KGB has mm-hmm. been doing that. And one bishop quoted one of these agents as saying, uh, 
we can stop this circus. In other words, the persecutions we're putting you through. We can stop this circus if you'll just go under the, uh, you know, the, the Ukrainian uh, autocephalous church, as they're calling themselves. And, and, and instead of staying under uh, Metropolitan uh, Anufri, who is the legitimate head of the Ukrainian church. Well, people who are real believers are not going to take that offer. P- people who are real believers are going to continue to to resist and to suffer. But it's what we're seeing in Ukraine right now is not a whole lot different than what you were seeing in, in, in the Soviet Union in terms of its treatment of the church and some of the worst days of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of uh, martyrs came yep. out of those days. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's awful what they're doing over there. Of course, uh, before we end this good discussion, there's a topic I know you're very passionate about, and, and I appreciate that. And that's the one kind of at the head of this interview, you said, uh, I was writing about the abortion uh, stance that was taken by a certain uh, Orthodox figure in a march. And so that's what got you writing all of these articles. And of course, abortion, since I've been a kid, that's been a heated issue in politics. And uh, I, I suspect the Orthodox stance, I don't know if it's officially Orthodox, but I'll ask you about that. Uh, the stance is pretty straightforward. Of course, at this point, cue the uh, rape and incest uh, excuse that everyone throws out there it, it, every single time you talk about being pro-life. But uh, is there an official church stance on abortion? Yeah, the but DDK is one of the oldest church documents outside of the New Testament. And it, it, the longer in title of that, if you translate it, is the teaching of the 12 apostles. And it's usually dated as being a first century document. But if anyone gives it a later date, they'll say what well, was early second century. So very close to the time of the apostles, if not written within the time of the apostles. But chapter two, verse one of, of the DDK says, thou shalt not kill a child by a abortion, uh, or thou shalt not murder a child by abortion or infanticide. And there are numerous canons that were approved by the ecumenical councils that likewise uh, equate abortion with murder. And uh, so the church has an unambiguous position on this question. Obviously, there are the rare cases where the life of the mother uh, could be in jeopardy. And uh, I think that if a doctor's trying to prioritize and save the, the mother's life, and as a result of that, the baby dies, is better than both of them dying. Because in those cases, it's almost always the case that if the doctors did nothing, both mother and child would be dead. Uh, but those are very rare uh, circumstances. Uh, and when you're talking about rape and incest, it's obviously an unfortunate circumstance. But the thing about that shows the dishonesty of the people who raise that question is if you ask them, okay, let's say we ban abortion, but we make an exception for rape and incest. Are you okay with it then? They're, all, they're always going to say, oh, no, I, I don't think that that's okay because they basically want to have abortion whenever they want it up through the ninth month of pregnancy and even after delivery in some cases, yeah. which is not even abortion at that point. It's just outright infanticide. Uh, so, so they're dishonest people. But if you're talking about like a rape or an incest situation that actually results in a pregnancy, uh, as I said, it's it's obviously a, a sad situation for anybody to have to go through. But compounding the guilt and the shame that is often associated with rape and incest with the death of a ch- of an innocent child is not a way that you're going to help heal the the soul of the person that's gone through that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it, 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 it's not an exception that makes any sense from an Orthodox perspective. Yeah, I, I agree. And I had heard when I first got into Orthodoxy, someone said, and I can't remember who said this, I wish I could give them credit, but it's not just killing a baby, it's you're, you're killing a soul. And I had never, ever thought of it in those terms before. Have you, I assume you have heard this well, you're killing. We believe that from the moment of conception, we're dealing with a human being. And uh, if you look at the scriptures, if you go to like the Bible Gateway and you do a search of the phrase "innocent blood," you're going to find quite a few scriptures that talk about how seriously God takes the shedding of innocent blood. And uh, so, to shed innocent blood is not a light matter, and an entire nation shares in the guilt 
when innocent blood is shed and it's, it's, and it's tolerated. And uh, if you read about, for example, in the, in the history of Israel, of course, the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrians, people taken into exile, and most of those tribes ceased to be identifiably uh, uh, Israelite. There are some remnants of those tribes that continued on in the land and sort of merged with, with the rest of the, the, the Jews because the tribe of Judah and Benjamin came to just be known generically as the Jews. And, uh, and now we, we think of anybody who is of that faith, at least, uh, as being a Jew, even if they actually had descendants, they were descending from another tribe or something like that. But um, um, no, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> that's <laughs> okay. Went down a trail yes. and, uh, and lost my train of thought. Well, that's okay. You have, you have a lot of thoughts. That's, yeah. there's, uh, <laughs> there's a large, you know, uh, my audience for the most part I would say they lean right. Um, they're worried about things, uh, where things are headed in this world. They're, some of them have found orthodoxy, uh, beautifully enough. And others are still kind of in a search. Can you speak to people broadly? What does, in your mind, what does orthodoxy offer people specific? And I, I, I know you could have, I could have asked this 500 years ago and it could be a similar answer, but even specifically to to fight against the the things that we're people like you and myself and my listeners see going on around us, uh, the nihilism of this modern age and and things like Seraphim Rose wrote about. What do you think orthodoxy has to offer against those the, the rising tide of evil that we see? Well, coming from a Protestant background, I always had a sense that there was something that was missing in in the in the faith that I had grown up with. And when I discovered orthodoxy, I found what I was looking for. And uh, it's the truth. And it, it's, the, it's the true faith. It's the life of, of the Holy Spirit in the church that you get to participate in. And certainly when it comes to the stuff that's going on in the world now, I think the Orthodox Church is almost the only thing standing against it. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a tradition that's capable of getting us through what what we're looking at right now and what we may be facing because our forebears have gone through as much uh, or, or even worse than what we've gone through or will go through. Uh, so, so we have a tradition that's capable of enduring persecution and also capable of taking firm stands and not be, being mealy mouthed because we want to uh, just get along and everybody to like us. Yeah, well put. Do you have any book recommendations off the top of your head? Well, Father Seraphim Rose's books are good. Obviously, he wrote them. Uh, he, he, he reposed, I think that was maybe 81 or something like that, or maybe a little after that, but, or, but in the early 80s. So there's some historical references that a, a younger reader might miss, but his Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future is an excellent book. And it's very relevant today. And there's also the the, the the booklet to nihilism, which deals with a uh, you know that whole phenomenon, which has become basically the direction our society is headed in. Uh, also, one of the things that he recommended was that people read good Christian literature, and he expanded that beyond Orthodox authors into things like Charles Dickens and stuff like that. Literature from a time where people still had a sane worldview. But I would say especially reading Dostoevsky's novels will, will prove to be beneficial. They're not only enjoyable, uh, but they, they're very instructive. And the, the, the faith uh, is, is the theme that, that underlies those, those novels, even though it's not always the most obvious thing if you're just reading it on the surface level, but it's there and it's, it's shining through the text. And particularly if you read it from an Orthodox perspective, uh, they're, they're beautiful. And I, I read all of his novels when I first became Orthodox. I just recently started rereading them. And so it's been, you know, like 30 something years between the first and second reads. But, uh, you know, they're, they're fresher in my mind right now. And they're very amazing books. They, you, you, they'll, they'll bring you to tears at times. And they're also not easy to put down when you get into them. But uh, so I would say those. I mean, there's lots of really good books. When I first became Orthodox, 
you could probably put on one bookshelf uh, all the books that were in English that were written for, right. for an Orthodox audience. Whereas now there are tons of books. So you can read The Fathers. I would say certainly The Saints of the Desert Fathers, The Arena by St. Ignati Branchininov. Reading the Bible is something people shouldn't overlook. Reading the Lives of the Saints. I would say especially reading more contemporary saints' lives, like there's a book on St. Paisius the Athenite that was written by Hiram Monk Isaac, I believe, who was a, uh, you know, someone who lived, you know, in, and, uh, you know, a contemporary of his that outlived mm-hmm. him. And uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful life. It's very hefty. Uh, but also, he, there are six volumes of his spiritual talks with, with nuns that were recorded and then they were transcribed into Greek. And then they were translated into English. Wow. And uh, I, I actually got my first volume of that because when the whole uh, COVID thing happened, there was a screenshot of a quote from one of his books oh. that basically prophesied what yes. was happening. Right. And I had to get my hands on a hard copy because I wanted to make sure someone didn't just Photoshop the quote and that it was real. And I wanted to see when it was actually translated and published. And, uh, and it's a legitimate quote. Since I don't, I don't want to get you into trouble with YouTube, right. we, want to, we yeah. want to elaborate on that. But you can just, I'll leave it to the imagination of the audience as to what he might have said. Yes, yes. But, so there are tons of, tons of amazing books out there to read. What's, uh, I'll say this, I've been to your parish now, I think three times, and I know I'll be back in the future. It's wonderful. I love the community that you guys have built there. And the liturgy, of course, is beautiful. And your choir, my goodness, amazing, amazing. And the little, boy, you have quite a posse around. You see it, it in, in my church here in Lockhart, Father Ignatius, we affectionately call him Father Iggy. He has to do a lot on his own because he doesn't have enough clergy, but you have, right. it's, it's, it's wonderful to watch, watch it all and be part of it. Um, right. But I, I will say at the end of this last one, when you talked about the schedule upcoming, I thought he's a busy man. I'm glad that he has time to even do this show with me. What's, in, what's a day in the life of Father John Whiteford look like? Typical. Well, it depends on how many services there are that week, but I'm always working on the liturgical calendar. That's really a never ending process because when I finish uh, one year, I'm already working on the next year. So I'm, I'm already working on the 2024 calendar right now, uh, even though the 2023 was just, you know, delivered in people's mailbox maybe a, about a month ago. Um, so, and I'm always trying to take time. Articles. It's just it's become a little bit harder for me to write articles at the pace that I used to, because I've now got two granddaughters that live 500 yards away, <laughs> and uh, when I have opportunities to uh, spend time with them, it's hard for me to say no. So uh, that that's one thing. But uh, but you know, I have a a daily reading schedule uh, of scripture and other books that I'm trying to read, and uh, so I'm always either reading, writing. Uh, working on the website, uh, working on the next e bulletin, trying to prepare the sermon. You know, so it's it, it's there's a, a weekly cycle of of stuff like that. But when there's lots of services, it makes it even a little bit more tight than that. Mm-hmm. And this week, it's one of those weeks. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's it's uh, as you listed it out this week. It's 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 busy for you. Plug away. Plug anything you'd like. Church website, blog, any anything you'd like. Oh, also the the Southern Orthodoxy thing too. Anything. We well, have yeah, the Southern, it's southernorthodox.org is the Ludwell Fellowship website. So that's a website that uh, I and some other people helped put together uh, that is focusing on, on orthodoxy in the South. And um, so it gets into cultural issues, but basically it's trying to see what's good and valuable in the Southern tradition that is compatible with orthodoxy and showing how they can connect as a means of reaching out to people uh, for, for, who are Southerners that might be interested in Orthodoxy. And uh, our parish website is St. Jonah, St. Spelled Out, dot org. And uh, so there's tons of liturgical stuff on there. You'll, you'll find the e bolts in there, also links to the sermons. And I have a blog. It's a blog spot. I believe it's Father Spelled Out, John dot blogspot dot com. But if you just Google my name, you'll find it. And uh, 
So, and, and like I said, I've been doing it since 2004. So there's a lot of articles on there. And there, if you look at the web version of that blog, there's a search bar. So if you're wondering if I've written an article on a subject, if you put the keywords in there, you'll, you'll find out. Yes. And like I mentioned earlier, that's very helpful uh, for people trying to learn about a lot of these things or who just have questions uh, in general. Father John Whiteford, thank you so much. What a blessing to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. What a blessing to have Father John with us. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Maybe controversial episode. Not really, right? I think if we can speak boldly and speak the truth and aren't afraid, I think we've learned that at this point, right? Do not be afraid. Do not apologize or speaking truth. And uh, that's why men like Father John Whiteford are so valuable for us to look up to, we'll say. As for this show, counterflowpodcast.com, we've got the Telegram group going strong. And man, I have a new sponsor that I can't divulge yet, but you think Telegram and Signal and WhatsApp are secure, you've got another thing coming. We have a whole new lesson to learn about that. And the soon-to-be sponsor, is going to be a safe haven for those of us who enjoy privacy. That's the hint that I will give you at this point. And next week, I've got two guys on. Here's the hint. It's two guys. Many of you guys have written to me and said, their Substack, their podcast is so great on geopolitical aspects of what's going on in the world, specifically in Russia and Ukraine. That's the hint that I will give you. Those two guys will be on next week. Until then, have a great one. See ya. Fucking half, cause I call him the hologram wrath. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.